on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. It was this whole thing with like worksheets and character sheets and all this stuff. And I literally broke out into hives. Like I had to go home and take Benadryl. I could not believe. You were literally allergic to plotting. I had an allergic reaction to plotting. I did. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show on a Friday with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. So we have lots to talk about ahead of a fantastic interview with a huge superstar indie author. How does 100 million... Is that, did I read that right? No, 10 million books sold, not 100 million. 100 books and 10 million sales. But, uh, uh, yeah, the interview with me is coming up. Um, uh, but, and, oh, no, 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 that's more uh, than me, much more that, than me. That is more than you, and not quite 100 books, but 100 books is coming up, and I've been talking to our interviewee today, Marie Force, about what she's going to do for her century. Hold her bat up and shake it at the uh, changing room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Marie Force uh, coming up, uh, who is a uh, huge inspirational figure, I think, in self-publishing Do you yeah that description? absolutely no i'm uh we've yeah, we've had marie's on been on before hasn't she um she has. some time ago but no um yeah. she's uh she's a very impressive author yeah great chat so that's coming up in just a few minutes uh uh before then we should mention that uh 101 opens our self-publishing 101 course which is your footstep to success in self-publishing opens on this wednesday may the 4th may the 4th be with you uh, 10 p.m. UK will be open for a couple of weeks and next couple of episodes we're planning at the moment that we're going to delve into some of those uh, details we're going to delve in we're going to pick out some of the fundamentals of self-publishing and devote an episode or two to those over the next few weeks so we'll uh, uh, listen out for that and Mark you've had an interesting week because you have house guests yeah we do so we mentioned this I think last week we, we um, Lucy and I applied to be sponsors for a couple of Ukrainian refugees um we're calling them guests now because I think refugees sounds a little bit. That doesn't seem like the right word to me. But anyway, so we we um, we found uh, a mother called Oksana and her son Roman, who's eight. Uh, we found them about a month ago and put the uh, started the ball rolling with the application process. Took ages, as I think I've probably mentioned before, but we we got the uh, the visas granted last week, late last week, and they they flew in um, to Heathrow yesterday and lucy picked them up and they got home to salisbury about 5 30 so there's been quite a lot of um we've been trying to get them comfortable and, and make sure that they're they're happy and um as happy as they can be given the circumstances but it's it's gone pretty well um the two um roman and uh samuel who's the same age they've gone they've immediately got gone on well they're playing together even though roman doesn't speak english and samuel doesn't speak ukrainian but they're they um you know you, universal language of play i suppose is, is are coming. they ukrainian or russian speaking they speak both um so we've we've arranged school for roman he's actually going to be in samuel's class and uh the school has a russian speaker so um he'll be able to to help uh, but it's yeah that's going to be that's going to be a big thing for him next week going to a school he's never been to before with people he doesn't know in a language he doesn't speak so um he, that's going to be something we're going to have to work quite hard to make sure is, is good for him. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been great. The the village has been really supportive. So lots of Ukrainian flags flying as as we drove down the road yesterday. As they drove down the road, came to the house, um, and uh, lots of lots of support. Um, I just just been you know it, it's quite a it, it's quite a thing. It's, it's a bit of upheaval for us in terms of our routines and things like that. But at the same time. We're lucky enough to have a space to to take them in. And, you know, it just seems they've been in a bed sit in Germany for two months living out of one suitcase, um, which, you know, Roman hasn't played with any toys. He's got an iPad, but that's all he's been able to play with. So immediately yesterday he went straight to the toy cupboard. And, you know, um, so that now one of the rooms is, it looks like a bomb hit it. There's plastic everywhere, but he's happy and Samuel's happy. So, you know, we, we, we feel pretty good about it. So that's great. Well, well done mm. uh, you for doing that, and it's uh, it's a, a small illustration of the hue and cost of the decisions being made by mm-hmm. uh, the Russian leadership at the moment. It's just appalling, isn't it? Um, having to pick up the pieces like this, but yeah, I mean, 
I wonder how long this will be. It's, um, you know, the war's not going away at the moment, unfortunately. In fact, it's ramping up in the west of the country. The east. Um, the, sorry, the east of the country, yes. They come mm -hmm. from the west, don't they, the uh, yeah. uh, family? Yeah. Um, yeah, gosh. Can you imagine it the other way around? Us, you know, yeah, being in a country, we have we, to leave. And I have thought about that, yeah. I mean, it's, it is something that I said to the kids, you know, you know, if, you know just think about if we had to leave and, and I mean, the, the circumstances were different. I mean, um, I, we would, you and I would not be able to leave. We'd have to stay. Yes. Um, so well, I'm found, 55. You're just, you, I think you'd still, you know, you, you'd still, you'd still slip in. So, um, but yeah, we would have to stay and, and our families would leave. So just trying to explain to my kids to think about what that would be like for them and, you know, to not see me for two months um, mm. and, and for, so, you know, it's it, those kinds of things. They, they are very useful questions, I think, just to try and put things in perspective for, for you know, my kids and kids in general. Um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, I think it would be, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm generally, I'm, I'm a fairly optimistic person, generally glass half full rather than half empty. And I, and I think most people are, are good and do try to be helpful and kind um yeah. maybe that's that could be a bit naive but i think that's generally the case oh, I, 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 I think it's undoubtedly yeah. the case unfortunately the um the one or two people who aren't mm. like that have a lot of power but uh in this case yeah. okay yeah. all right well look, we'll um without invading oksana and roman's uh privacy it'd be nice to keep updated over time mm. uh with them and how they get on and uh uh, we look forward to hearing that. Maybe some inspirational story ideas will come out of this. I'm sure they will. Books will come out of this anyway. But um, and art yeah. always follows these events. So, and I've had I've had some emails from Anton Ein, who yes. you spoke to. He yeah. he's um, I mean he emailed me the day after there was a ro rocket strike or a missile strike on Lviv. Six yeah. or seven missiles hit, and, and he said he could feel the building shook uh, where he was. So he was close enough to it, and you know he's um, he's fine. Um, but I think. He's. He said to me, "It's kind of put it in perspective that he, nowhere is safe. Um, mm. Some places are safer than the other places, but you know, even Lviv, which is miles and miles and miles away from where the main action is at the moment, you know, Russia can reach out with its missiles without any problem at all um, to to strike targets there. And you know, in, in that, it wasn't just military targets that were hit, whether by design or by accident. Um, I think it was a car repair workshop was." had a direct hit and four members of staff were, were killed. So, um, mm. you know, it does, it does put it into perspective, but you know, Anton is fine. He's, he's had some, um, some posts in the group about a book that he's hoping to launch and asking for some advice on his cover and his blurb. So, uh, and we've actually, we've enrolled him in, in all of our courses. Mm. Um, so he's, he's going through the launching course now because he's, he's ready to, to put this book out. So, you know, I think when that's ready, I might do a little uh, post to my readers again and see if we can get some more um, attention for, for him when that book comes out. Good. Well, you know what we've forgotten to do? Oh, patrons. We have a couple of patron um, uh, people to welcome, patrons to welcome, I should say. I've got them in front of me, so I'm going to welcome Louise Rule. I know a Louise Rule. Louise Rule from Hampshire in the UK and Debbie Osorio from Florida in the USA. Uh, Debbie and Louise, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show to support the show and get some goodies in the process. And don't forget, uh, you can join us live in June in London uh, for the self-publishing show live, funnily enough, uh, at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live. Right. I think we're ready to welcome on our honoured guest, and she is an honoured guest. I always get so excited about talking to Marie. I find her a fascinating person to talk to about her process, about her approach. I find it quite inspirational. And uh, and so, yes, yeah, so and no apologies. I think her third appearance, but it has been over six years. She was one of our very early guests. Uh, so mm. Marie Force from Rhode Island in the USA. Here she is. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Marie Force, welcome back to the Self Publishing Show. We love having Marie Force on the Self Publishing Show. I think this might be your third appearance in, in I the think so. five or six years that we've been running. But are yes. you, a, you were a very early guest, and uh, I'm a huge fan of everything you've oh, done. Thank you. you guys make me feel very popular. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you are very popular, and I think the figures back that up. So, first of all, for people who I don't know if they live on Mars and haven't heard of you, perhaps don't know too much about you. Why don't you introduce yourself and your, your writing background, Marie? 
So, um, Marie Force, I am a um, author of contemporary romance in all its various forms, including um, straight contemporary, romantic suspense, erotic. Um, I have done a couple of historicals. Um, don't anticipate going back to that very soon because my contemporaries are keeping me so busy. I'm, I actually was just going to say I've worked on three of my books today um, wow. at various stages, you know, so um, time is always, you know, passing by. Is that three um, books so, in, on, in different genres or all the same? No, sub-genre? three books in three different series, actually. Um, I'm finishing Gansett Island number 25, which I can't believe it's going to be the 25th book is out in July, putting the finishing touches on that. And the um, the first book was out in 2011, Made for Love, which was like um, just this like, let's publish it and see what happens. The first three books, three months in a row. And it like just took off like nothing like has since before or since. Wow. <laughs> so um, it was just, you know, this really exciting um, little start to the series that I wrote about a fictional island off the coast of Rhode Island, which is based on Block Island, which is a real place that I love very much. And so like all of my years of going to Black Island and um, I'll show you, I actually have to sign the first 24 Gansett Island books after this and they're sitting right next to me. In <laughs> okay, <this place. laughs> very cool. There <laughs> so, you go, sneak peek. So yeah, I yeah. Saw- so and then I write the Fatal series, First Family, Miami Nights, um, Quantum, Treading Water, um, and a bunch of standalones. I probably, I think I forgot a series. Oh, um, Vermont, Butler, Vermont. Yeah. Um, yeah so <laughs> so how many so far do you think i think um 93 books okay so i think that's 13 more since we last spoke or maybe a bit <laughs> maybe. more than that and and yeah the it interests me the this different subgenres. contemporary romance seems to me to be when i look at the charts and i see which romance authors are topping it mm-hmm. contemporary romance seems to be the dominant one in terms of sales it, would you it, feel that it, as it well is. um yeah, and, and like what's really been interesting to me is to see the the real resurgence of fantasy in the last couple of years as well, um, which is totally. I, I mean, like I I just did an interview yesterday where I mentioned that I was born without a suspension of disbelief button. Like I just can't I can't make my head go there. I'm I'm all like, wait, that couldn't happen, you know? So I, I'm not your target audience for fantasy or paranormal or like I couldn't read Harry Potter. I tried with my son so many times he also was born without the suspension of disbelief (laughs) but so I mean it's so awesome that there's now some there's just something for everyone out there no matter what you're um what you're interested in and all the various um even the 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 niche genres within in um romance are just killing and so a lot of stuff in um there's like alien romance that's like you know, taken over KU and people love it. And um, it's gotten a big boost from TikTok. And it's just great to see like so many different things having a moment, you know? Yeah. How are you on TikTok? I am. I'm not, I'm not very active on TikTok. I, it's just, I don't know. There's only so many hours in the day, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, let's talk about that. Cause I'm interested in how you manage it all, Marie, and how you, how you make time for the creative process, which does require time. You have a team. You've always had a team from the first time we spoke to you. I imagine it's bigger now. No, it's not. And no? that's by design. <laughs> okay. No, we, um, I mean, I have, you know, two core employees who have been with me for both of them since 2013. Um, one kind of runs the business and one is the CFO and she kind of keeps track of all the numbers and like, you know, she's checking to make sure like the ads are paying off and like, you know, she's down in the nitty gritty of the statistics and all of that. And, you know, it's really great to have that kind of analysis available. Like when you run a promotion or something to be able to see, you know, how it's going. Um, So, and then I have uh, my cousin Jean actually does all my shipping and um, she's uh, very much involved, um, but on a part-time basis And then we have a number of other, you know, contractors and whatnot who do like design and, um, you know, promotion and publicity and, you know, editing and so many different people involved, which is awesome. Um, But really two full time employees. And then um, my cousin, who's who's regular part time. She's working, you know, she works every day, but not full time. And who who runs your ads? Do you do that yourself? Um, no, I have somebody. Um, so listen to this. You'll be interested in this. I got hacked on Facebook in October um, to the tune of 50 grand on oh. two different credit cards that were compromised, which we got back, fortunately. 
But once all the dust settled and I went back to try to start advertising on Facebook again, I noticed there was a pixel attached to my account that is not mine. Um, and I brought it to the attention of people at Facebook. And I said, listen, this isn't my pixel. I'm not going to advertise if somebody else is tracking my, you know, behavior and whatnot on, on Facebook. And I said, if you need to remove this pixel from my account and they wouldn't do it. So I haven't placed an ad on Facebook since October. Wow. Um, and I'm finding that it hasn't really made any kind of impact on my sales, which is the most interesting part for me. And I was spending a, thousands of dollars every month on Facebook ads that were apparently doing me no good. So that's been an interesting development. I'm going to move some of that budget into TikTok advertising because I do feel like that's something that could really pay off. Yeah. But, um, so how, you so know, how did the hacking happen? What was the sort of nature I of it? I don't know. I don't know. Like um, I was just on Facebook one, you know, one Sunday and I looked at my notifications and people were responding to my new ad about a chainsaw. And I'm like, wait, what? So I was just like, what's that? So I dug a little deeper and realized I'd been hacked. And by the time we were able to shut it off and then it kept turning itself back on, it was this whole big, like, yeah. So, um, it wasn't just me either. There was other people I knew that were involved in the hack. Um, so it was kind of like widespread, but I will say that I have not spent a single dime on Facebook since that day and it hasn't hurt me at all. So, wow. um, I thought that was a very interesting observation, you know, like, um, obviously I have, you know, Amazon ads going, I have somebody working on them. And then I have my news list, newsletter list is, is, you know, has grown to a great number. And so that obviously I have other tools that I can use in my Facebook um, footprint is pretty big and Instagram and TikTok. But um, I was really thinking I was spending a lot of money on Facebook ads and now I'm not. Yeah. So, so that was back in the autumn, did you say? Yeah. October. That's interesting. Very interesting development to me. And, um, you know, I'm sort of a little afraid to turn off the Amazon ads, but part of me wants to do it just to see what will happen. Um I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, there you go. It happened for you. Uh, I mean, I, I was thinking if it was recent, the tail on all your new, your read through the tail perhaps would have covered up any drop off, but actually that's been long enough now that it would yeah, have been Yeah, it's been read-through. seven months, seven months. <clears throat> wow. Well, and that's um, we're still seeing the roughly the same average daily sales across all the platforms. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. I mean, like I was really like, for years spending a lot of money on facebook every day and um i mean that's not, not that's not to say that you haven't got to the place you've got to without paid advertising because no absolutely <laughs> not no 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 i think it's been definitely part of the process i i would venture to say though that my activity on a day-to-day -day basis of just sharing you know fun little life things and funny things that my kids say and my dogs and, you know, me walking three dogs and, you know, things like that have done as much to grow my following as ads have. Yeah. If not more. And is that just my daily presence there? And is you that know? Facebook groups or as well as a page? Both, both. <clears throat> pages, groups. I have a, uh, I had a friend that was doing some work for me on Facebook and she was like, oh my God, Marie, what the hell? Cause I have um, groups for all of my series. That way I can target the promotions to, people who are just interested in that one series. And I do cross promote in the groups, but um, you know, I probably, this is back before anybody had groups for anything that I set these up and now they're, they're big enough that I can't abandon them to just go into one group, you know, so, like the Ganson Island group has 14,000 people in it. I can't just say, Oh, I'm going to move. Cause that's not going to happen. You know? No. <laughs> so, and this is something I remember from our very first chat, Marie is how much attention you pay to your readers and how the oh, readers are not simply customers to you. They're part no. of the sort of organization almost. They are. And you know, what's interesting is so many of them have become really good friends of mine too, which is so incredible. My husband and I just spent the winter in um, South Florida and I had this one reader friend who I've gotten to know pretty well since I've been writing a series in Miami and she's been very helpful. And um, she's actually um, immigrated here from Cuba during the revolution and was so instrumental to me when I was writing about, you know, a third generation Cuban American and her family and all of that. She was so great. So um, she and her husband invited us to come up to Palm Beach and they gave us a tour and they took us out to lunch. And like, they're, they're people there. I've met so many amazing people and um, you know, we've made some really, really nice friends among my readers. That's like the most recent one, yeah. um, but I've known her for years, but we haven't really hung out before and it was just so much fun, you know? So 
I love that. I so can... yes, I am very down on the street with my readers. <laughs> you are. I know you spend a lot of attention. Well, it's clearly a very worthwhile. I mean, I hate to call it a tactic. I think it's a very genuine thing with you, isn't it? It's not. It's not. Oh, a... It is for sure. I enjoy it, or I wouldn't do it. It's just like what you said about TikTok. Like I don't enjoy TikTok, so I don't do it. Yeah, you sure. know. So it's like. I mean, I, I know I need to, and I'm going to try to do more there and I'm going to try to be more present there, but it's just not my natural, you know, it's not my natural thing um, to do. And I, and I, and I find myself more and more backing away from like live Facebook things where I have to put the makeup on and like, you know, be turned out a little bit. I just, I can't, I can't be bothered. You know? <laughs> so, like that's just, I think that's pandemic living has ruined me completely. You know, 23 years of working at home and then yes. throwing a pandemic and now I'm fully feral. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't make any effort to appear on camera, so it's probably how well, I... you don't have to. I know, because I'm a man, I know. So... I would love to grow a Listen, beard and not have to worry about... <laughs> I don't make the rules, Marie. I don't, you know... Don't, just don't blame it's them. Unfair. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfair. It's um, unfair. We get talk... ready to go out and my husband's like, let's go. And I'm like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, now, remind me, you have you had your, your Rhode Island get together for years, but I guess obviously COVID has put that, um, the kibosh on that we for We only bit. missed one. Fortunately, we only missed 2020. We had it in 21. Oh. Um, and we had it in DC, actually, in 21, which we had planned for years <laughs> to do. Because um, I have a series set there as well. My fatal series is set in DC. Um, so we had, we took uh, reader weekend on the road in 21 and we were, it, we caught this like little sweet spot in between various spikes of the pandemic where everything was relatively normal people. Most people who came had been vaccinated. And um, so it worked out well. Like we, we were like, you know, like yeah. we had to make a call at one point, like, cause um, Julie, who's my COO and she, she's actually a, um, a, a professional meeting planner. That's what she used to do in her past life. And, that's how I know her. Actually, we work for the same organization. I was in communications and she was in meeting planning. Um, but um, we were like at like, oh God, when do we have it in June? So like in May, she's like, we have to make a call. We have to either do it or not do it. And we're at the point where if we don't do it, it's going to cost us money. And like, so we decided to do it. And then we were like held our breath for like a month. You know? <laughs> but fortunately we were able to, to get that done. And then we have one in um, Rhode Island, this year, July 15th and 16th in Rhode Island, where we take them to uh, Block Island on a day trip. And we have, it's really fun. I think it's our eighth or ninth year that we've done it since 2014. And then um, next year, we're going to Miami in April because um, I have my Miami night series, which I'm also signing today. So that's right here. <laughs> um, and then we're going to do a leaf peeping um, thing in Vermont and New Hampshire, which is when foliage season peaks in October. Um, cause I have a series in Vermont as well. That's actually ending in January of next year. So we thought that would be a good time to have a little send off for Vermont. Did you call it so, leaf peeping? Is that a, yeah, that's what they call it. Leaf okay. peeping. It's a season in Vermont, like right yeah. along with spring, summer, autumn, mud season is a thing in Vermont when all the snow starts to melt that there's a season for mud. Right. I think <laughs> I prefer the leaves, but anyway, um, yeah, the leaves they put on quite a show in Northern New England. Yeah, in the I bet fall. they do. And so, how, how many people come to the uh, get togethers? What do you call them? Um, Cons or like, is it Marie Con? -ish. No, you know, what's funny about it is that it started out that way. Like it was about, cause really what it was a selfish effort for me to not have to travel a lot when my kids were still home and in school and I didn't want to be gone all the time. So I said to Julie, let's have them come to us. And it, it's turned into like this, like, they don't even come for me anymore. They come for each other. You know, they've all become such good friends. And there's like, this, I see like throughout the year, like somebody who came to reader weekend once. Okay. He was a teacher in uh, Wisconsin or in Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin. She came to reader weekend with her husband one year and she put a thing up on Facebook about um, needing supplies for her classroom. And all these people from reader weekend, like come swooping in and outfit her classroom. Like I see stuff like that every day people celebrating each other's birthdays. They met through me. And I wow. love that. I absolutely love it. And people going, I've seen some of the people from reader weekend go into Ireland to visit friends that came to reader weekend. And it's amazing what it's, what it's become. It's, it's awesome. It's like a family reunion now. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, and so yeah. with the team that you outlined earlier, you organize all of this. So Julie does all of Reader Weekend. In fact, she's been peppering me with questions today and I cut her off at 10. I said, I can't handle any more today. <laughs> she's Enough, like, Julie. I could, 
<laughs> I can tell you're maxing out with me today. <laughs> so yeah, when I'm answering questions about Reader Weekend 2023, today i'm like no i'm done yeah yeah <laughs> so, well, but no she's way. she's great she she makes it all happen um we laugh because she lives in a small condo in virginia and we call and we call that like you know reader weekend headquarters and then um she moves up to new hampshire in the summer but you know we all work remotely so um it's really it's it's great so she runs she's right the nerve center is in her little condo in virginia <laughs> <laughs> okay let's talk about writing a little bit i remember um from our conversations before you are the ultimate discovery writer i think you said to me the last time i interviewed you and i do quote you on this that you you start writing excited to find out what your character is going to do in that yes. chapter um, yes i make it all up as i go along <laughs> and you still do that <laughs> always yes you don't although i did just do something i don't normally do i'm going to jump my butler vermont series forward five years from uh, the second to last book, the penultimate book, I love that word, mm. um, to the finale, um, there's going to be a five year jump. And so I had to make a list of all the babies that have been born, the weddings that have happened. So I actually made a list, which I don't normally do ahead of time. I usually let it all happen on the page and then I have to clean up the gigantic mess at the end. Um, so yeah, that, that's usually how I do it. But today I did, a, I think that might be called plotting. I'm not sure. <laughs> some, some may call that. And do you, some, some. <laughs> who looks after that? ordinarily who looks after the universe consistency stuff is that your readers or do you have a team doing that i i do most of it myself but i have um recently hired a very part-time assistant who's a rabid reader of my books to do a lot of the fact checking for me um so she's gwen has been a huge help to me in keeping up all the series bibles and the who's who and various universes and all this stuff and then um i reread a lot like Last night I was rereading Ganson Island book 24 to make sure it lines up with book 25 and guess what? It doesn't. So now I got to go back. <laughs> do some. Um, yeah, I'm finding the older I get that the harder it is to remember everything the way I used to. And so I really don't rely on my memory at all anymore because it's failed me on a few occasions. So I really go back and check everything. I have word files for each series that has every book from the series. So the one for Gansett has like 4 million words in it. Um, it has um, every book. So if I want to know what's been said about a character in the past, I can literally go through and search for that character and come up with every single thing that's ever been said about them so that I don't forget anything. Um, it's very useful to me. I know that people have more sophisticated ways of doing that, but I'm very like happy with the old school word file um, that works for me. So, yeah. and do you ever uh, do you ever do something I've just had to do with, with one of my books? One of my books only on two, but I had to go back and change something in book one that was already published. Um, I have done that on occasion. Like, um, I like I've swapped. Like, I just noticed that I swapped the occupations of two brothers of a um, of a character from way back. So, like, I swapped their professions. So I just told the readers about that and and I'll go back and fix that um, in the earlier books so that they match up with the later books. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that, I'll fix that. That's one of the great like, things you know, about Kindle and print on demand. We can do that. Yes, yes, because I have a similar situation with my Butler Vermont series where two brothers profession, I got to watch out for that. Two brothers professions got swapped, but it happened in one of the first six books, which are still owned by Berkeley. So I can't do a thing about it. So um so I've just committed to the swap <laughs> Yes. <laughs> in the later books. Cause like, what else can you do? Listen, it, it shit happens. Okay. Yeah. Like there's 560 characters in my fatal series. Every so often something's going to go wrong. Um, but I do also have a team of beta readers for each series. And those beta readers are experts on that series. They reread it so often that they scare me that they know it better than I do. So I started recruiting some of those people to be last line of defense beta readers that's actually what i call them and they are the last ones to read um and they know it's coming so they bone up on the last few books so they can make sure that i get it all right so that's been very helpful genuinely you'll start a story you, you, so you've got yourself up to date hopefully with with what's happened in the past and you start a story you, you have some vague idea what's going to happen at the beginning but then you genuinely write chapters and things just take their own course Yes. And, and sometimes uh, that's nerve wracking. Cause like right now I'm writing the, the third, um, the third first family book, which has my homicide detective from the fatal series is now married to the president and she's the first lady. 
Um, so there was this like spinoff from Fatal where he suddenly became president when the, he was vice president, which everything was pretty normal for them when he was vice president. But now that he's president, everything is not normal, <laughs> but she's keeping her job. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm balancing a lot of things um, between his new world and, and trying to keep her front and center as, you know, the way it has been in the Fatal series with her cases really kind of the key part of the books. And I'm finding that to be difficult. I mean, because his, his stuff is so interesting to me. Yeah. You know? So, um, but anyway, um, now I'm grappling with, okay, so what's the case going to be in this book? And I don't know that yet. And I'm like 6,000 words into the book and I don't know it yet. So I mean, anytime that, now. <laughs> yes. I mean, there'll be people listening to this who do write in a similar way. And then lots of us, and I'm included, who wouldn't, who shudder at that idea. I mean, I'm, in, I'm <laughs> well, see, researching I went... my next book now and I'm not going to start until I've got the story done. Okay, well, see, then I'd be, you know what, I worry about my ADD would kick in and I'd be bored with it if I knew what was going to happen and I wouldn't finish it. Yeah, I would be saying um, that. I live in a perpetual state of fear of losing interest, you know, and because like, let me tell you something, if I'm not interested in something, you can't pay me to engage. My husband gets so mad about that. And he'll be like, listen, I need you to focus. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> you know? not going to happen. Like, I <laughs> don't care. <laughs> so my son is exactly the same way. He like has crazy ADD as well. And the two of us are just like, yeah, uh-huh, we're not interested. <laughs> well, I, I do. I, I'm jealous of, I'm jealous of the idea that a writing session for you is like a reading session for somebody as well. It is. That's such a good way of putting it, James. That's exactly what it is. And that's why I think it's still so much fun for me because I don't have any idea where it's going. And it always surprises me where it ends up. And I'll just be like, I'll go back and read thinking I've got complete crap. I'll be like, oh, this book just totally freaking blows. And then I'll read it and go, yeah, not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure you do that. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't understand like how it works. And I, and like people say to me, Oh, will you ever teach writing? No. How do you teach that? Like, I, like it's chaos, you know, that's organized somehow, you know? And I mean, yes, there are downsides to that. Like, like I said about the professions getting mixed up and stuff like that, a plotter that wouldn't happen to a plotter. You know, I think that's much more of a pantser problem. Yeah, um, probably happens, or a a discovery bit, probably happens a bit to everyone, it, particularly with that volume of books. It's gonna, there's gonna be some, some things. Yeah, there's gonna be some snafus. Fortunately, they're minor, you know, yeah, and um, don't matter so much, it's yeah. little things that don't take away from the enjoyment of the books. People do love to point them out, though. They do take oh, a perverse yes. pleasure. Oh yes. You know, in letting me know that I messed something up, and like for the first two or three days after a book's out, I kind of rock in a corner waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. when's it coming <laughs> yeah thanks very much for letting me know on page 71 oh, yeah, yeah they yeah. love that nothing ruins a release week more than some reader telling you that you screwed something up you know like thanks a lot yeah, yeah. <laughs> occupational hazard um and with so many books you're going to have a lot exposure to a lot of that stuff so tell us about your writing routine marie is that has that changed much over the years it has not changed at all in fact i was going to say when you were talking about the plotting and like the shuddering like you know how you can't start until you've got the whole I went to a plotting workshop once. I love to tell the story that my New England chapter of Romance Writers of America had. And it was this whole thing with like worksheets and character sheets and all this stuff. And I literally broke out into hives because I could not believe, like I had to go home and take Benadryl. I could not believe- You're literally allergic to plotting. I had an allergic reaction to plotting. I did, because I was so freaked out by the fact that I should have been doing it that way, that it, like I had written about four or five books at that point, And I was like, oh my God, like I'm doing it all wrong. You know, and like I, I itched all the way home wow. and had to go home and take that. I literally broke out in well, lives. It, ha- it freaked me out so badly. I would hope the person giving the workshop did say at the beginning, this is not for everybody. This is, there's no right and there's wrong here. Obviously you sat there Actually, thinking. Actually, she was very committed to this being the only way. Right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> she, you know, so, you know how some people like, like, I feel like I tell people all the time, there's, there's no right way. There's no wrong way. Yeah. There's only your way. Um, whatever works for you. But at this particular presenter was very committed to this method. And um, there was no gray area where no. I was firmly in the gray area having an allergic reaction. <laughs> Anxiety episode. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So it has not, my process hasn't changed at all. Um, I am realizing that it would be beneficial to me to write things down like I just did for, um, I'm introducing, you know, in this jump forward, um, there's now, uh, so the two families, there's a family of 10 and a family of eight. And, you know, the books have been all about them all finding love. So now the grandfather has suddenly 38 
great grandchildren since we last met. Nice. <laughs> so I need a list. Okay. I need to know what their freaking names are and <laughs> who they're attached to. I think he, he needs so to I know as well. He probably has a list. Of course. Yes. He has them written down. And um, actually I'm going to use my, my sister-in-law had eight grandchildren in four years. Um, and she has them in her iPhone. She has a list with their names and birthdays. Pictures, yeah. Otherwise she, she would not remember like their birthdays and stuff. So I'm going to do that for him. Like I'm going to have him, you know, have a, a like a spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> their names and birth dates and who they belong to. <laughs> I imagine so, that does happen. You know, that is like a, a concession to growing older to me that I have to write that stuff down. So, but I did start a new series last summer. I started writing um, a spinoff of Fatal. It's called The Wild Widows. And that's the other series. I said I was forgetting one. Um, in which young widows come together to support each other. Um, and, you know, cause that's a uniquely special experience in, in the sense that, you know, you still have most of your life ahead of you and you've lost your person. And, um, and it's, it's a, it's not the same as the white haired widowhood, you know, it's very different dynamic. So it's been very interesting to write, but I had this whole plan that I was going to sit on my boat last summer the boat that I inherited from my father. That's a millstone around my neck. The 40 year old boat, the 40 foot boat. I, I remember, I was going to ask you about the boat, but you're going to sell yeah. it. So, oh, the thing, no, the thing is, uh, my, I'm going to take his advice and drive it out to sea and sink it one of these days, but um, it's driving me crazy. But anyway, so I'm sitting out there last summer and I said, I'm going to write down all the wild widows, their stories, their backstories, their ages, their, per I didn't do any of that. I didn't do it. I never did it. And I've made it all up on the page. So sometimes I have good intentions to do some plotting, but then it just doesn't seem to happen. So I don't know. I, I've got to stop questioning what works. It just seems to work. So, yeah. but I do know it would be easier if I would, you know, do a little pre-planning. But I did for the next first family book, they're going to be riding on Marine One. They're going to um, Camp David. So I've been reading lots of books about Camp David marine one the secret service so there is some prep work that gets done so don't think that there isn't but there yeah. you know it's all very chaotic <laughs> so, oh, it's, a, it's a winning formula scene. um and well, you... well, i i describe it as a sausage factory um nobody wants to see how sausage is made but yet we like the taste of it so yes. it's kind of very similar to Ex what goes on here except on this show we do like to see the sausages being made but so uh, yeah for your readers <laughs> i can understand um and in terms of actually writing <laughs> do you 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 write on word or do you use uh, scrivener or i write in word two thousand words a day religiously um i recently had covid um, I managed to avoid it for two years. And then my son brought, I got it in my own house when my son came home from graduate school in Boston and brought it to us. And my husband and I both got it in our own house. Now we've been cautiously traveling. We went South for the winter road trip, you know, caught it in our own house. Yeah. So for three whole days, I didn't write. And that was the worst part about having COVID. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. I said, this thing cost me 6,000 words. Yeah. But then I, you know, felt very compelled to make them up the following week and caught up quickly. But I'm very religious about that to the point that like where we stayed in Florida this winter, we had room for friends and family to come visit. And I would tell people, come on down. But in the morning I'm writing, you know, I like, I'm very fanatical about those 2000 words a day, seven days. And a week. It's really all I need to stay on schedule. That's what I need. Seven days a week. I try to do seven days a week. And here's why, because my husband and I are both slow in the morning and we don't ever do anything until afternoon. So if our kids are grown They're They live in New York and Boston. So when they come home, that's obviously a little different dynamic, but um, for the most part, it's just us and our three dogs. And we both like a nice slow morning with newspapers and coffee. And I, and I write my 2000 words. And then if we want to go do something, we do it later, you know, but I usually have the time. So why wouldn't I, yeah. you know, if I have something else to do, you know, then obviously I won't do it on the weekends, but for the most part, it, we're just chilling the two of us. So why not, yeah. you know? And you do that in one session, 2,000 words, or do you do, do half much, an hour and yeah. get up? And... Yeah, and let me add this, though. In most cases, I'm writing series that I've been writing for years. In the case of Gansett, I started writing this in 2006. So what did, I can't do that math. 16 years for Gansett and Fatal. I've both been going for about 16 years. Um, the Vermont series I've been writing since 2013. So... I'm in very familiar worlds most of the time. Miami's newer. The Wild Widows obviously are newer. 
Um, but you know, you're pretty much stepping into these worlds that I've existed in for 16 years in some cases. So it's not like it's a huge, like mental challenge to write 2000 words because I'm in that world. And I know all the, I know all the parts and pieces and players and locations. And it's, you know, it's like almost intrinsic at this point. So, um, is that the right word? <laughs> yes. Uh, and I, it's uh, instinctual. Uh, yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, in some cases that is, that is true. What is more challenging are book one in a new series or a standalone that I I've never, you know, written in this particular space before Then that. It obviously takes longer and is much more involved at first than, um, these series that I've been writing for years. Yeah. So, um, it's just, a, I don't want you to think like, Oh, 2000 words just rolls off. It's it, some days it does. Some days I finish my 2000 words at 7 PM, but I finish, I get them in, you know, if, however, even if I have to go back to work after dinner, which I hate to do now, cause I'm so old. Um, I used to write only at night when my kids were home and young and working in the day, I wrote only at night. Now I can't function after 7 p.m. So I'm good for watching TV and zoning out. But if I haven't finished the 2K, I go back and finish it. Oh, so very impressive. I try. I try. It's the one thing in my whole life I'm disciplined about. I do try to walk every day too. But yeah, don't be too impressed. It's really the only thing that I really am holding. It's the only thing holding the whole thing together. You can't, you can't you know? order me not to be impressed with you, Marie. But I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be. And uh, No, really though. I mean, like it's, it's the one thing I'm fanatical about, like really fanatical about. And I just told Julie recently, like I've gotten that way about walking too, because I found that it really is very like beneficial in so many ways yeah. to me and walking my dogs. I have three dogs. So when I walk them, if I'm not paying a hundred percent attention to them, I'm doing that at my own peril. So I'm not thinking about work. I'm not thinking about anything but them. And I find that to be a nice little mental break too. So I told her I've recently started assigning that the same importance as the writing because mm -hmm it's good for me to get out and do that, you know? So those like, that's a mindset, you know, just making sure that the things that matter most to you get done in a day. Yeah. And I've been working at home for 23 years, um, 10 of them for myself, and 13 of them for somebody else. So I was pretty good at working at home when I started doing this full time. And I think that's a big challenge for a lot of people coming into this thinking like, Oh, working at home, you know, like I could do this, this, that, and the other thing, like I step over, messes in my house to get to work. You know? And I've done that for years. Like I leave dishes in the sink. I do them later when the work's done. So I think that that's a, a process that people have to make an adjustment to being at home. And a lot of people have had to make that during the pandemic and learned those lessons. Of course, writers are famously procrastinators. So suddenly the washing up looks attractive because. Oh you God. And you know what? In the, in my heart of hearts, nobody is a bigger procrastinator. I like I will get something in the mail, like from say like the dermatologist and I know it's a copay. I'll let that sit on my counter for a month before I pay it. Even though I know it's like a $20 copay and, and they need the money. And like, I just can't be bothered, you know? So it, it all depends on what it is, you know? Like my, my friend Lisa, who's the CFO, she'll come over here and she'll see my stack of mail. She goes, do I need to deal with that? I'm like, no, I got it. And then she'll come the second time so, and it's still there. She yeah. starts opening it. Maybe I should just deal with it. Yeah, I get to know yeah, you. For F, she's like, for F's sake. Yeah. <laughs> now you've, you've referenced getting old, older a few times in this interview, I've noticed. You don't look a day over a very young age to me, but oh God. I'm interested. In I'm going to be 56. Okay, so you're, we're the same yeah. age. We're the same age. And Are you, we? And you look, yeah. te you look at least 10 years younger than me, maybe oh, 15. So, all right, James, you had me at hello. Stop look, it. There you go. Um, <laughs> but here's my question. Has, has your writing, your characters, and you talk about the president and, and first lady now and so on. Is that changed as you've got older? Were you writing about younger characters when you're younger? You are, are you are writing about older romance now? I'm still writing in the 20s and 30s for the most part. Um, I am finding I'm less interested in writing sex than I used to be. I'm bored with it. Um, I do it. I keep it in there because it's part of my brand and people expect it, but you're going to see less of it. I think, you know, it's just, I mean, how many times in different ways can you, I was like, going to say, know. there's only so many ways you can describe sex, but I know. And it's just like, I like when I hit a scene like that, I'm just like, ugh. you know, like, but I do it. And like, and then I, <laughs> I don't do it, but I write it. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> I come back and I expect it to really be kind of lame. And, and again, I'm surprised by the fact, okay, so maybe that's a little bit instinctual at this point too. Like they just seem to come together 
well, we've got I'm just Lydia, getting into you such can't talk pun. about sex without it being I'm getting into such pun area. <laughs> yes, this is puntastic at this point. But the scenes seem to work in a way that I wouldn't expect them to because of my lack of interest in writing them. Um, and I think that that I try to keep them very character driven so that like it's these two people and it's unique to them and their story and they're not just in there to do it. It's there's a purpose to it, but I, I really am writing a whole lot less of it than I used to. Yeah. My, my earlier books were way sexier than these are, but the readers are not complaining. So yeah. And do your, <laughs> do your uh, books have different levels of spice? I know one of your series is erotic, so I guess that would be different. One of my series, my quantum series is erotic. And um, I, they're begging me for another book in that series, which I ended a couple of years ago. And I'm going to probably write another book in the series, but I don't think it's going to be erotic. I think it's going to be um, more character driven and more just like, you know, I, I want to write something about um, one of the characters' parents. And um and I, I know exactly what I want to do with it, but I don't want to write, I don't want to write erotic anymore, you know? So I think I'm going to probably, it'll still be spicy and everything, but it won't be like, you know, the BDSM yeah. genre that the other earlier books are. And I, I think the readers will be fine with that. They really like the characters in that series a lot. Um, so they're, they're desperately asking me for more. So if I give them more, it's going to have to be on my terms at this point, you know? Yeah. So Plus, I have a picture I want to use on the cover of my parents' best friends on the day before they were married, and they look like two movie stars. And so I can't. I, I said to her, she's 95 now. Yeah. And I said to her, I want to use this picture. And she loves my books. She loves them. She, like, she actually wanted me to give her a copy of the Quantum series, but I wouldn't give it to her until she turned 90 because I said she wasn't old enough to read it yet. And then on the day she turned 90, she called me and said, I needed to bring her those dirty books. <laughs> so I told I her, that. I said, I want to use this picture of you and Bob on the cover of this book I want to do in the quantum series. Um, but I promise you, I won't make it um, too dirty. And she says to me, well, it needs to be a little dirty. Yeah, <laughs> so, I love that. So that kind of gave me permission, you know, <laughs> which I just cracked up laughing. So um, this picture, though, it's, it's, it's iconic. And I can't wait to use it on the cover of one of my, my parents' best friends, you know, my late parents' best friends. Oh. Um, from the day before they got, they look like movie stars, James. And I said, I've got to use this because it's, it's the Quantum Series is about Hollywood glamour and, you know. Sounds so, great. So 93 yeah. books, you're coming up on a century of books. Are you going to mark that occasion? I know. I don't know. I got to think about that. I'm trying to figure out when it will be probably sometime in 23 at this point. Um, I don't know I, what, what the plan is. I'm trying to figure out a good way to celebrate 25 Ganson Island books. Um, the Ganson Island silver anniversary. I don't know. I got to think of something. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's astounding to me that it's gotten to almost a hundred books. I mean, how'd that happen? <laughs> well, I think a hundred books is, is, I mean, 93 is a, it is an achievement, but I think 100 is, a, mm. is an opportunity to mark that, and I hope you do uh, one yeah, way or the other. Yeah, we will do something. We'll probably do a big giveaway of all of them or something, you know, yeah. and do something. I, it, it's been like, it's just, been, it's still so much fun, you know. I mean, I find myself um, having fewer Fs to give about the business side as I get on, and I, I really just find myself less and less interested in, like, the just the nonsense that goes, you know what I mean, too, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. just the... You know, just well, the crazy stuff that goes on. Well, it you seems know? to me like, you're doing just, things on your terms more, um, which is it is it is a yeah. way of of, of well, giving longevity because it's not you can't go on forever with the level of intensity you probably had ten years ago in terms of business. Well, but I'm still writing the same number of books and all of that, but I'm just not engaged in the in the business the way I was. I, I'm not like teaching classes anymore, and I'm not like. I'm just not doing workshops for groups. I well, actually I'm doing one Saturday, but, right. but I'm not doing as many, you know what I mean? I'm doing less of anything that, that takes away from the writing time. I'm doing less of that kind of stuff and more um, just focusing on the writing. Cause like, you know, I, it's just, it's the thing that I like most like to do as well as the thing that pays the bills, you know? And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm doing things like um, spending time like this past winter, my husband and I went to Florida for a couple of months, which was the first time we've done that. And it won't be the last. Um, but it's a beautiful thing because I can write anywhere. But I was worried that when I got down there, I'd be like, ooh, shiny thing, you know, and the wheels would fall off my bus. But they didn't because I stayed disciplined with that 2,000 words and the daily walk. Um, so, yeah, it just like changing up the scenery a little bit really helped, you know, and um, finding that to be beneficial, doing things like that. So, 
Good. I mean, just whatever it takes to keep producing. That's that's the that's the goal anyway. <laughs> All right, it's been fantastic. But I am I am definitely less interested in the business itself sure. than I than I was, you know. And I'm also a hundred percent. I think maybe since we last talked, I'm a hundred percent indie now. Um, I'm no longer under contract to any publishers, which is probably better for me. Um, and that way, I set my own schedule. I write what I want to write. I put the covers on that I want to write. I you know, I can do all these crazy things in my books, like bring back past characters for new story and like, you know, do it the way I want to do it um, with nobody telling me otherwise. Um, so, yeah. Do you think you'd ever reading. take a significant time off? Do you think you'd take three months, six months off and not write? No, I don't know what I would do with myself. I, no, I have trouble taking a week off. Like, I just, no, I don't see that. And I, don't, I already told Julia we're, we're not retiring. That was not news that she was welcoming of. <laughs> she's like wait a minute what she goes why do i have a retirement fund i'm like, yeah i don't know <laughs> but no i i don't see that for myself i don't see me i don't see a retirement or a period of like months off or i do sometimes think about taking a year off and just completely percolating on new books and like you know not publishing anything during that time but then i think no nah, i don't want to do that you know the readers i don't want to make the readers wait that long and so finally, Marie, tell me about the boat, because last time we spoke, I seem to remember you were quite e emotional and excited about your father's boat. Uh, and I am, Yes, I, actually, I have a picture. This is before it was renovated. So it's all renovated now. But look at that, like, cool picture. That's my cousins amazing. Took. It looks like the boat it's from Jaws, so cool. sort of high up. And... Yeah, it is a little bit like that. And, and it, it sort of treats me like the book from Jaws, the boat from Jaws. <laughs> so you've it's, not had a happy um, relationship with this boat? I have a very happy relationship with this boat until it starts blowing smoke out the back as we're driving it up the bay to go away for the winter. And then that costs me like $8,000 to fix. And yeah. the engines are old. They're the boat is a 1981 boat. So the engines are probably 50 years old. One of them, we, one of them we replaced in 2016. And I've got the other one in my garage for when that needs to happen. We almost had to do it this year, but we tried to put new engines in it. And here's the thing. We have 17 inches to work with. All the new engines that are available for what, what we wanted are 19 inches. Right. So we were unable to put new engines in it, which unless I wanted to get diesels and spend crazy money on them, which I don't. So the problem that I have is I've invested a lot of money in making it beautiful, but now it's uninsurable at its new value because it's still 40 years old. Right. So that's my, that's my dilemma. So I can't spend any more money on it. It doesn't make sense, you know? It's that old adage about boats, isn't it? The two two greatest days of boat ownership are sure. the day you the day you get the boat and the day you sell the boat. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I'll probably keep it for a while, a couple more years. This will be our thirty fourth year with this boat, our family. So, uh, I think it's there. I think it's, it's crazy. I think it's a member of the family but now. We still love it. Yeah, yeah, it it is. And my parents, both my parents, my mom's been gone eighteen years this year, and my father for four. But both of my parents loved that boat. And I see them both in various places there. Like, you know, there I can go. picture them there. And like, we're, we're still finding, like last year, we tie up a lot with my cousin and, not, and his wife was telling him, you're not wearing that shirt. It's too wrinkled. And I go, wait. And I go in and I, I pull out my mother's travel iron from like 30 years ago. And I bring it out there like, come on, come on. They call it the Smithsonian Institution. There's something there <laughs> in every drawer. <laughs> Anything you want, we've got it, you know. So. Oh, Marie, uh, it's such fun talking to you. I really look forward to our conversations. And uh, honestly, I, we're Thank so, so thrilled with your success. And uh, and for you to, I think you're an important person in the self-publishing community. You're such a leader, a natural, effortless leader. I know you don't set out to be one, but you are uh, an inspiration. So that's, that's, that's what I want to say to you. I appreciate that, James. Thank you. And I, we appreciate everything that you and Mark and your team do as for everyone. So... We, everyone appreciates you guys <laughs> there you go look we'll speak to you next time and maybe sometime in person who knows maybe i'll come to a rhode island i would love that too. i would love that i would love it that would be great if i ever get over that way again i'm looking forward to actually having the opportunity to get back over to the uk you let us so, know so let's do it <laughs> Mate, not in the boat take a flight take a plane yes yes i can fly right from boston Whoop, over go. there <laughs> all right thanks marie thanks for having me this is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. It's a time of year when my camera's overheating, so we haven't got long, Mark. Okay. No. Um, but Marie right. Force is, uh, I know it's a bit of a cliche, and he's every time a force to be reckoned with in, uh, in self-publishing, but she really is. And somebody who started off in trad as just absolutely liberated and 
flown in Indy and did say to me, book 93 is now done, seven away from probably middle of next year from uh, from her century, that she's 100% Indy now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, you know, I always expect to speak to her and say, well, she now has 10 people working for her, but she keeps her team quite small and is quite hands-on with it all. Yeah, absolutely. That's... Um... No, I don't have anyone working for me really on the on the, the book side of things. It's very, very similar um, in that sense. But no, I mean, 100 mm-hmm. books, that's, that would be quite an achievement. There aren't that many authors that will get to that kind of, no. that kind of level. Kind of Barbara Cartland wrote about 1,000, didn't she? But she dictated them whilst sitting on a chaise lounge to her secretary. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I uh, imagine you, that's you how you write. Sh- it is actually. Yeah, I'm going to be sitting down later, and um, I've actually had a, a there's a chaise lounge in the barn, so I'll be ready to um, sit down and, and dictate. So you know, you, you could apply for that job. You can be my my, my PA if you like. I could okay. be your di- I could James. be your dictator. You you could be yes exactly. Yes, that'd you be can, good. You that, can take, be. take down mine. Particular- no, 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 Partridge, move on. Um, oh, I'm listening to that on audiobook at the moment. If you're a fan of <laughs> Alan Partridge's uh, autobiography, on, it's on yes, Audible excellent. now. Yes. Um, good. Okay. Look, that's it. Thank you very much indeed to Marie Force. Uh, thank you very much indeed to the team behind the scenes who make this podcast happen. As I say, we are hoping to, uh, if we can organise ourselves, and it is busy at the moment, we're going to try and do a couple of uh, sort of tech episodes, if you like. Not tech, that's the wrong word. What's the word? teaching episodes um Mm -hmm. back to our roots self-publishing show uh so we'll do that in the next couple of weeks if we can and we're also going to announce some of the details of our live show in the next few weeks so lots Mm. coming up and don't forget self-publishing 101 if you're not already on board a chance uh the window opens on wednesday may the 4th selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101 that's it all that remains for me to say is this a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me Goodbye. goodbye Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.